Well, you aren't going to believe it. I got a private message here on YouTube from somebody very important. Oh, it was very exciting. It was a big day for me. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. You ready? You want to know who it was? I got a message from William Tyndale himself. I mean, here all these years I thought that he died in the 16th century, but I guess apparently he didn't die and he's here on YouTube. I mean, right there's his name and picture and everything. It's amazing. William Tyndale even wrote to me and he had questions on the King James Version. See, all this time I thought he would have been a champion of the received text, but here he's actually using Alexandrian perverted philosophy. Of course, I'm being a little bit sarcastic here. You know, this, whoever it is that is this user named William Tyndale, uh, they're lost, they're on their way to hell. You're going to see that as we go through these questions here. It's just incredible, uh, some of the ridiculous nonsense that they bring up. But these questions are some that Alexandrian perverts will typically bring up to Bible believers to cause you to lose your faith in the King James Bible. So I want to actually show you these questions, and we're going to go through this. Okay, so let's start out here. It says, Hi, I have questions about the King James Version. If you want to answer them, take as much time as you want. Gee, thank you. Question number one. If the KJV is the perfect word of God, then what about the marginal notes that were part of the 1611 King James Version. Let me show you what they're talking about here. I have here, this is a photo scanned copy of an original first edition 1611. Okay, this is, you know, you can't get any closer to it than this, other, unless you have a real one yourself. But uh, let me show you here the marginal note here over on the side. It says, or, calls, or do cause thee to offend. See there, and of course you have the old English S there, looks like an F kind of thing. So there you have that, all right? Continue with the question. Some Bibles still contain them. They show alternate translation possibilities. If the King James Version is perfect, they shouldn't be in there. Why are they removed from most King James Version Bibles you buy today? All right, uh, first of all, I just want to say the King James translators were just average men. They were not perfect themselves. But what they did was they were very honest. That's why they would put in italics any words that they had to put into the text to make the text, you know, work, basically. But they would put in words into italics saying this is not part of the Greek text, all right? And why they were doing that is because when you translate from language to language, it's not going to be a direct translation. Okay, study foreign languages sometime, you'll see that you can't just go from language to language. All right, there's different things there. You know, there's, there's uh, words that you have to put in to make the translation happen. All right, that, that's just common sense. All right, anybody that knows, you know, anything about translation from any language to another language knows that there are words that have to be put in. All right, the King James translators were honest men. And what they would do is they would say, okay, here are alternate readings. And you say, well, then that's calling the text into question. No, because what they're doing is they're showing this is an alternate reading, but this is the correct reading here in the text. So some people might say, well, what's the alternate reading there? Or is there an alternate reading? These men were scholars, okay? The King James translators were scholars. So they would say, here's the alternate reading, but this is the one we chose. That's why it's in the text. And again, God used imperfect men to make a perfect translation. See, this stuff would make sense to a Bible-believing Christian. This guy's not one, all right? And he's far from being William Tyndale, by the way, too. Question number two. Oh, I'll, I'll finish the, the thing there. Why are they removed from most King James Version Bibles you buy today? Because they're not necessary. Okay, it's, it's just wasted space having alternate readings in the margins. All right, doesn't mean anything. If you want the, to see the mar marginal readings, go out and buy a, one of these things. Question number two, where was the perfect Bible before 1611? Um, again, aren't you assuming that, you know, the King James Bible was the first time that there was a perfect Bible and, the, and that we King James Bible believers teach that the King James Bible was the perfect Bible and there was never a perfect Bible. See the warp mentality? But it's funny because I actually heard a guy say the one time 
they, one of these new versionists, they, they come along and they say, where was the perfect Bible before 1611? Uh, well, let me ask you a question. Where was your Bible before 1881 with Westcott and Hort? And actually, I could even ask a better question than that, Mr. Uh, William Tyndale. Um, where is the perfect Bible today? See, that's the real question. You say, I don't believe it's the King James Bible. Okay, where is it? Can you produce a copy of God's perfect word? See, that's the real issue there. But see, what these guys try to do is they try to say, the King James Bible believers say the King James Bible is perfect, the others are not, therefore, before 1611, nobody had the perfect word of God. All right, well, uh, I don't teach that. I believe that there have been accurate copies of God's preserved word for different people in different languages. But again, the mentality is that everybody on earth has to have a copy of God's perfect word in their language. Well, that's ridiculous. That's not even true of the original autographs. Think about it. For thousands of years, what was the perfect word of God? Hebrew. Then after that, Greek. God only chose two languages, and they say parts in Aramaic or whatever. Three languages? For a few thousand years? See? So that, that, this warped Alexandrian perverted mindset of, you know, where was the perfect Bible before 1611? Hey, where's the perfect Bible today? Are you saved? How do you know you're saved? Can you prove that you're saved? Well, I have my feelings and opinions. Yeah. yeah. Question number three. Does a guy who speaks Swahili have to learn English in order to read the Bible? Uh, well, let me ask you another question. I'll answer that with a question, actually. Um, does a guy who, in, in the past, if you go back to the first century, that same guy that spoke Swahili, if Swahili was even a language back then, that same guy that spoke Swahili, would he have to learn Greek to read the Bible? Back before that, the guy that's speaking Swahili, would he have to learn Hebrew to read the Bible? People like this, their minds are leaving them. It's crazy. Does a guy that speaks Swahili have to learn English to read the Bible? Well, that depends. Is there an accurate translation into his language? You can translate and have a, a copy of a language translation that matches the King James Bible and gets it as close to the King James Bible as possible. Not a problem. Now let's listen to this next question here. Number four, I don't believe that the King James Version is perfect. Also, I don't believe in hell. Well, <laughs> kind of goes hand in hand. But in universal reconciliation. Uh-oh. We're dealing with a lost man here. Most certainly not William Tyndale. Back to the question, he says, does this mean that I'm not saved and God will torture me forever? Absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt, yes. Yeah, yeah. If you believe in universal reconciliation, you're an idiot. I'm sorry, there's, you know, I'm trying to be charitable here. I'm trying to shock you enough that you'll think about it and actually get saved. You know, I mean, the Bible over and over and over again, the King James Bible says, unless you come to the Lord as a sinner and put your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ that he, you know, shed at the cross, you're going to go to hell. All right? I mean, that's just an insight. I mean, watch the salvation message on our channel, okay? What a question. Number five, do you realize that Jesus and Paul didn't use the King James Version? Really? Oh, were you around back then? And um, what Bible did they use? Oh, uh, the Bible wasn't even finished yet. Why would you even ask a stupid question like this? You know, they didn't use the King James Version. Wow, you really proved your point there. I mean, I'm totally convinced. I'm just, I'm done with the King James Bible. I'm going to quit preaching. I'm just going to go out into the world and, and believe that it, God saves everybody. Like this moron. You know, and don't get shocked by my harsh and crude speech. Somebody like this, universal uh, salvation, reconciliation, excuse me, and they don't believe in hell? 
I'm supposed to respect somebody like this? I don't think so. Uh, and of course, you know, the thing there, did they, they, they didn't use the King James Bible. No, but they used what they were using back then has come down through the centuries to us today. And, you know, if they were alive today, they'd be using the King James Bible. And of course, you know, the Lord has used this book more than any book in history. More people have been saved. More missionaries have gone out. More great works for the Lord have been done through the pages of the King James Bible than the original autographs. Okay, number six. If God always gives the world his word in one language, as King James Version advocates say of English, what, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> okay, you're lying. You're lying right there. See, you're setting up a straw man argument here. If this is the truth, then blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. No. King James Bible believers, those that really know this issue, I can't speak for some, you know, some of them are not that bright and they come out and make a bunch of stupid statements. King James Bible believers do not teach that the King James Bible is the only perfect Bible in the world. Okay? I believe that you can take any language and get as close as you can to this book right here. You can use the received text and whatever, you know, and, and anything else, but you get it, you know, Luke 2.33. All right, perfect example. King James Bible says Joseph and his mother. The new versions from the Vatican say his father and mother. Now, whatever that equivalent is in that whatever foreign language you're going to translate into, you make it match up with the King James reading. Okay, why? Because it's the right reading. Obviously, Joseph was not the father of Jesus. So you say Joseph and his mother, not father and mother. So whatever your language translation is, you make it line up with this reading right here, not with the Westcott and Hort, but with the Vatican reading. Obviously. But let's continue here with the question. If God always gives this the word, if God always gives the world his word in one language, as King James Version advocates say of English, then the King James Version is certainly not that language for God chose Koine Greek, not English, to reveal his new covenant. Again, this is a non question. This doesn't even make sense. Okay, He set up a straw man there, formed this little fake argument that King James only advocates say that only the English is perfect. How, how could we even say that? It's not even logical. The, only the King James Version, English of the King James Version is perfect. The, the Greek was, couldn't have been perfect. Well, then how do we go from Greek to English? Number seven, why weren't the King James Version translators King James only? Well, I would say because God hadn't revealed that to them yet. All right. And again, the word King James only is a very elusive term. I'm not King James only. All right. I am a King James Bible believer. All right. I believe that there are other translations out there in other languages that match the King James Version, and they're just as much God's Word as the King James Bible is. So, Again, this question here, you know, why weren't the King James translators King James only? Because they were men that had an understanding of what the Bible is. You know, these guys, I remember reading the, the, you know, about the translators and the work that they did. It took them seven years, you know, 1604 to 1611. And I think it was like, um, what was it? Uh, I forget how many tests that each book of the Bible had to go through. It's been a while since I researched that. Sorry, it's slipping my mind right now. But the point is, these guys, test after test after test, they had three different committees. Each one, I think it was, I think it was 21 tests because I think it was seven tests that each book had to pass in each of the three committees. So three times seven is 21. I think that's it, what it is. I'd have to look that up. So, you know, don't quote me on that. But, but uh, you know, they had all these tests to perfect the King James, you know, translation that they and then another thing that they would do, they would actually have somebody stand up and read their translation that they had made, the authorized version of 1611. They'd, they'd stand up there and they'd read it. And then they'd have a bunch of scholars sitting there reading along in foreign language translations. Now you think about that. You talk about some intellectual giants there. These guys reading along in foreign translations, translating it in their mind and comparing it to the reading of the authorized version that they've just been working on. 
Wow, that's incredible. Were they King James only? No. Am I King James only? No, I'm not King James only. I think that you can take this book and you can translate it into any, any language out there as long as you're faithful and true to the Word of God. And you aren't going to go back to the Vatican, back to this ridiculous garbage over here. The Nestle's, This is the 28th one. This is the newest one that just came out not too long ago. As long as you don't go back to this ridiculous filth over here from the Vatican. You know, the, the quote-unquote church that killed Christians and killed the real William Tyndale. But let's continue. Number eight, why didn't God inspire the Geneva Bible or Tyndale? Why are you asking me that there? You're William Tyndale, aren't you? I mean, you should understand why your particular translation wasn't inspired. You know, <laughs> yeah. Why didn't God inspire the Geneva Bible or Tyndale Bible? Uh, well, again, you're going back to this thing of, you know, God re-inspiring or something like that, which I don't believe. I don't believe that God re-inspired as in made it wholly brand new. No, I don't believe that. But what I do believe is that God spoke to these men that were working on the King James Bible. And the new and the versions that were there, the Tyndale and you know, going up through the, the Coverdale and Bishops and you know all the different ones. Again, you know, I'm not going to name all of them right now, but the Geneva and you know, leading up to the King James Bible, I believe that God was working through each of those committees, right? But he waited until it was time for the seven year, you know, the number of, of completion there, seven year process that the King James translators did to do this book, to make this book available for us today. See, God waited until that time to give us his true perfect word in the English language. It was a refining process. See? All right? So, the Tyndale and the Geneva are in a long line, the a succession there of purification. All right? But anything, any work that you do, any work that you do at all, has to be proofread and checked and, and have other people read. Does this make sense? And things. Any book that you do like that is going to have to go through an editing process. Why wouldn't it be the same for the King James Bible? For the Word of God for the English speaking people. See? Well, let's continue. Number nine, do you know that the King James Version was not translated from the Textus Receptus? Again, this is a misleading question. It was not translated from the King James, or from the Textus Receptus. Uh, okay, there's a number of ways that you can say this. First of all, the Elzever brothers, which came out after, you know, I think it was late 1600s or something, the Elzever brothers were the first to coin the term Textus Receptus for this right here, you know. Textus Receptus. So technically it wasn't technically the Textus Receptus at the time that the King James Bible was translated. A little word games. But then the other way that they can say it is that the King James Version doesn't always follow the Textus Receptus, which is true. It's absolutely true. But what does that mean? What does that have to do with anything? All right. The Textus Receptus comes from the Greek Orthodox system. The Nestle's text, the United Bible Society text of today, comes back, goes back to the Vatican. Why should we translate it perfectly to match the Receptus or the, you know, Alexandrian? No, the King James translators were scholars, and they were directed by God to translate it accurately and perfectly. Again, these questions—they don't mean anything. This is stupid. My light's starting to go out over here. But uh, let's continue. Um, question number 10. If there is a perfect Bible, then why is it the King James Version and not another translation? Well, you know, again, see, the question is based on doubt. If there is a perfect translation, then why the King James Version, not something else? Well, you know, by the fruits ye shall know them. What are the fruits of the King James Bible? Salvation, more people getting saved, revival, missionaries going all over the world, great movements of God. What are the fruits of the New Bible versions? Apostasy, 
you know, ecumenicism, all kinds of wickedness and evil. How do you know the King James Bible is the perfect word of God in English and the others aren't? By the fruit. If it's God's word, it's going to prove fruit. It's going to produce fruit. Why are these things so hard to figure out? Okay. Well, because this guy's lost. Continuing here. Um, number 11. Why did the King James Version translators render Genesis 15.6, which is quoted in identical Greek by Paul in Romans 4, 3, 9, 22, Galatians 3, 6, in four different ways. Because that's how the Lord led them to, to do it. You know? I mean, again, you know, you have somebody coming along and they're saying, you know, why did the King James translators do it thus and thus in this way and that way? Okay, what you're doing is you're, you yourself are coming out and you are questioning the work of 54 men that spent seven years. 54 men that were scholars, tutors to the royal family, writing dictionaries, masters of translation. But you know better than they do because you've gone to seminary or you have seen some videos by James White or you've read his idiotic book or something like that. So now you know more than the 54 translators of the King James Bible. You might even have a, a you know, computer software program that enables you to look up things in Greek and Hebrew. You know, so you're just, you're smart. And those translators were, they sure were stupid, weren't they? You know, and see, again, let me say this. Another thing that this brings up to question number 11 here, this thing about uniform translation. And what a lot of people do is they'll say, the King James translators translated such and such word here, but then over here they translated it differently. But it's the same Greek word. Um, any translation that's worth anything is going to do the same thing. There are many times, okay, I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. How do you translate the English word post? Think of all the different ways that you could translate that word, post. All right? You have a post office. You have to post something on a bulletin board. Your soldier is supposed to keep his post. You can have a wooden beam that's a post. See, I mean, there's a lot of different ways. So how would you know which definition or how do you define that word post? Well, it's by the context in which it appears. So it is with good Bible translation. You might have a Greek word that can be translated different ways, but you look at the context in which it appears. Again, this is, this is sound translation of the King James or of, of any Bible, not just the King James. Any Bible out there, the way that you translate the thing is you look at the context, right? So to say that every Greek word has to be always translated and spoken the same way every single time, no, you determine it, the translation of the word by the context in which it appears. I'll give you a good example of that, the word Pascha, all right? And they say it always should be Passover. No, it shouldn't. You look at the context in which it appears, and you can study that whole thing, the Acts, you know, the book of Acts there, I think chapter 12, and uh, let me just look here quick so I get my quotation right. I think it's Acts 12, 4, but I'm not, just want to make sure. Acts chapter 12 and verse 4, yep, okay. But you see, you say, well, I think it should be Passover, not Easter. Because Pascha, you know, should never be, you know, Easter. It always should be Passover. Okay, well then let me ask you a question. What's the Greek word for Easter? It's Pascha. Okay, a lot of Greek Orthodox churches will actually say at Easter time, they'll, they'll call it the Pascha celebration. And they're not talking about Passover. They're talking about Easter. Very interesting. But you'll notice there in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, in verse 3, it talks about, it says, Then were the days of unleavened bread. And then after that, it talks about Easter. The interesting thing is, you have Passover, and the days of unleavened bread follow Passover. So if you have the days of unleavened bread, how could the Passover come after that? It has to come before it. So what that proper translation is there, it's Easter. And Herod was a pagan. He was not a Jew. He wouldn't have cared about celebrating the Passover. 
but he would have celebrated Easter. See? So, uniform translation, this thing of you always have to translate every Greek word the same way in every context in which it appears, that's another lie of the new versionists. And ironically, all the new versions do the same thing. They do not uniformly translate the same Greek word every time, you know, the same way every time it appears. So, again, this is a non-question. It doesn't prove anything, except for his ignorance. Okay, question number 12. Do we really need a perfect Bible translation? People never had a complete, perfect Bible. Uh, well, if you don't have a perfect Bible translation, then you don't have a perfect God. Just as simple as that. I mean, if you have a God that can't write a Bible, I mean, think about that. I worship a God that has created the universe and has created every man and he knows everybody out there and he knows what's going on and everything else. But he can't make a, a book without mistakes in it. That's a rather strange God, isn't it? I wouldn't worship a God that can't write a book without mistakes. But you see the satanic philosophy of old uh, William Tyndale here? Pretty ridiculous. But let's continue. And by, Oh, it said there, people never had a, perf a complete perfect Bible. Well, we do right now, stupid. What are you talking about? People never had a perfect, complete Bible. It's right here. It's right here. And you're, the fact that you're not believing that is because you're lost and on your way to hell. And you, it is a literal hell where you're going to burn and you're going to scream forever. Why? Because you reject Jesus Christ and you reject the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you don't believe this record right here of Jesus Christ, you're not going to have faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ to you is just going to be a figment of your imagination, whatever you want to make him into. Give me a break. And you can read uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. I know you don't believe the Bible, but you know read that sometime too. That will hopefully clue you in on a few things. Uh, question number 13. Where in the Bible does God promise to preserve his word in just one perfect Bible translation? Again, I don't believe that. Okay, I'm not King James only and that the, only the King James has ever been the perfect Bible that's ever existed in the world. I don't believe that. Okay, don't be ridiculous. All right, again, you're bringing up stupid questions that a real Bible believer doesn't believe. All right, where in the Bible does it say God would only have one perfect Bible? I don't believe that. All right, in fact, it's interesting because in Acts chapter 2, you can see God was already going and having men speak in other tongues other than Greek and Hebrew? Hmm. So the Holy Spirit was inspiring other tongues before the Bible was even finished. Do I believe that the King James Bible, that, that God's perfect word is limited only to the English language? Absolutely not. No. But you make your foreign language translation line up with the King James Bible. I have a brother over in the Faroe Islands that did exactly that. He made a translation in the Faroese tongue directly from the King James Bible. Praise the Lord. These Alexandrian perverts can't figure things out. Um, question number 14. Is the King James Version more important than the Greek and Hebrew? I love this question. Give me a minute here. i got to... Fix my camera. All right, is the King James Version more important than the Greek and Hebrew? Well, right here I have the Greek and the Hebrew. There you have the Hebrew. Back in here you have the Greek. Here we have my old Cambridge. Cambridge. King James Bible. I'll get to some uh, text here that I don't have marked up. Book of Job. Then Job answered and said, How long will ye vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? Well, here we'll go. We'll go to the New Testament. You know, we'll really do it right. King James Bible. 
There you have the Greek. Isn't that a blessing? I mean, just look at these precious promises of the Lord there. Isn't, isn't that beautiful? I mean, you know, over here you can read it, you know, and understand it, but, but you know, isn't it so much nicer to, to see this and just look at these beautiful, precious promises of the Lord? And is, isn't that wonderful? I mean, oh, wow, look at that. I mean, you can just take that thing out on the street and witness to the lost and preach the beautiful sermons, the beautiful promises of God. Just preach from this wonderful Receptus in Masoretic Hebrew. You know, isn't that beautiful? Look at that. Look at those beautiful promises. Uh, yeah, I'm being sarcastic. Okay. <laughs> um, is the King James Version more important than the Greek and Hebrew? Uh, I would say a definite yes. Absolutely. Is the King James Version superior to the Greek and Hebrew? Yes. Absolutely. Oh, 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 blasphemy. Oh, yeah, sure. See, what you are, if you're saying blasphemy, you're an idolater. Your idolatry is for this book right here. You say, oh, it is not. It is not. I just have respect for the original. Order. Were you saved out of this book? Or this book? Why do you have reverence for something that you can't even read? Huh? I can read this book and I can preach out of this book. Been doing it for years and years and years. Why would I waste time with that? I mean, even if, even if I could go and I could study and become an expert in Greek and Hebrew, do you really think I can do a better job translating a Bible out of this than the 54 scholars back in 1611? 1604 to 1611, I'm going to do a better job than those men. Those men that lived at a time when there was no electronic smog, you know, messing their brains up. Everything they ate was organic. Think about that one, you know. But I'm somehow smarter and everything. Sounds kind of like evolution philosophy to me. Man gets better and better and better with time, and, and the Bibles get better and better and better too. Until what? You know, Again, it shows the mental illness of the Alexandrian pervert's mind. They believe that the Bibles get better and better and better and better with time, and yet you never arrive at perfection. Think about that. You're dealing, when you deal with a real true Alexandrian, somebody that understands the Bible version issue, and they side with the Roman Catholic, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, you know, Nestles, Alon, all that garbage. When they side with that, you're dealing with somebody who is lost or mentally ill. Usually both. But let's read the last question from our good friend William Tyndale here. Who publishes the perfect King James Version, Cambridge or Oxford? I go with the Cambridge edition. All right. And again, you get somebody that, that prints, you know, you go to a dollar store and you get this King James Bible for a dollar you know, printed in China or something like that, and it has misspelled words or the words aren't quite printed right or something like that, and you go, see, the Bible's not perfect. Well, that's a stupid argument. Anybody can print the King James Bible. Anyone at all. So if somebody messes with some of the words and says thoroughly instead of throughly, like the Cambridge edition, Somebody goes along and they, they mess with other words and they, they make the capital S spirit into a lowercase s spirit and they, they change other things, change the spelling. If they're doing that, that doesn't disprove the perfection of the King James Bible. It proves that there are faulty printers out there. People that are not conscientious about the way they print the King James Bible. That's all it proves. Again, this is not an argument against the King James Bible. So... My advice to you, William Tyndale, you know, William Tyndale, uh, first of all, you need to change your YouTube name, okay? Do, do not uh, mar the character of a great man of God, a man that died for his faith, a faith that you have not in your own life, that you know nothing about. You are lost. You are on your way to hell. You asked the question there, you know, I don't believe in hell, but in universal reconciliation. Does this mean that I'm not saved and God will torture me forever? God is going to send you to hell, to the lake of fire, to the place where he prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew chapter 25 talks about that. 
you are going to go there. Not because you are not King James only or something like this. Um, you reject Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell and you're going to burn. What you need to do is you need to drop this proud, haughty attitude against the King James Bible and you need to go and you need to get a good copy of an authorized King James Version. I recommend local church Bible publishers. Their text lines up with the Cambridge edition. Or get a Cambridge Bible, a real Cambridge Bible. You know, don't go out and get a dime store, you know, or dollar store, I should say. They aren't dime stores anymore. You know, go to a, don't go out to a dollar store and get some, you know, Zondervan or something or some other cheap, you know, King James Bible and then complain because it doesn't have the right renderings or the right spellings, all right? So that's my advice to you. If uh, you've watched this video and you are um, a King James Bible believer, hopefully I've answered some questions that the enemies of God's Word will bring up. Um, there's a lot more of these videos I'm going to be doing in the future, answering a lot of these attacks on the King James Bible. So don't be discouraged by these people like this it's just disgusting I mean you have lost people now that understand the Bible version issue and that are coming out and using the modern version arguments to actually put down the word of God see that's the real fruit of the modern version philosophy the Alexandrian school of thought it creates lost people it gives them grounds to blaspheme the true word of God and men like James White are giving ammunition to the lost world to mock and put down the King James Bible and any Bible really. So stick with the King James Bible, um, read it, believe it, and uh, get saved if you're lost. So that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.